Welcome everyone to the AIHM weekly wellness webinar. We are thrilled today to have Dr. Deanna Minich with us, who will be talking with us about eating the rainbow, the science of colorful plant-based food and practical strategies. So as we're allowing folks to come into the webinar, I just want to thank all of you for coming today. The Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, for those of you who don't know us, um, we are a global interprofessional integrative health association working to transform healthcare, body, mind, spirit, community, and planet. And we hope that you subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash AIHM Global. You can come back and watch this webinar there. Um, it will be up on our YouTube channel and Facebook um, page as well. And I'd like to um, let you all know about a fantastic opportunity. Uh, we have a wonderful Integrative Health and Medicine Fellowship. And um, for those of you who are viewing, um, if you decide to sign up for that fellowship, you can get $1,500 off tuition for mentioning this ad and that you um, watch the wellness webinar with Dr. Deanna Minich today. So you must obviously be eligible for the fellowship to be able to take advantage of this, but we really encourage you. This is just a phenomenal program um, for MDs and DOs. It um, fast tracks you to get uh, ABOIM certified at a national level in integrative medicine, if you're interested in that. And um, you can apply today at aichem.org slash fellowship. So today I would love to welcome our special guest, Dr. Deanna Minich. She is a nutrition researcher, educator, and functional medicine trained clinician with more than 40 published scientific articles. And she's also the author of six books on nutrition, wellness, and psychology. She served on the Institute of Functional Medicine's Nutrition Advisory Board, Curriculum Committee, and as a faculty member teaching nutrition for the Advanced Practice Module for Environmental Health. She serves on the board of directors for the American Nutrition Association and is president of the American College of Nutrition. She is a fellow of the American College of Nutrition and teaches for the graduate program in human nutrition and functional medicine at the University of Western States and so much more. So Deanna, it's truly such a pleasure to have you back in our AIHM community and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation today. Welcome. Uh -huh. Thank you so much, Tabitha. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I think that I can share my screen now, right? Let's see if it'll come Yes, out. you can. That... Super. Great. All right. Great. Slide. Well, here we go uh, into the rainbow, <laughs> as I like to say. And I was just letting Tabitha know that I had just done a, a more recent literature review of all things phytochemical. So I'm going to be sharing some of those recent findings with you. If you're interested, also on my Facebook page, I do try to post recent studies to keep everybody apprised. This presentation, I wanna make science-based, but also incredibly practical because what I care about most is the translation of the science. It's good to know the studies, but it's even better to actually put that into action. So that's going to be my focus today. Keep in mind, and all of you would know this, I'm sure, being um, practitioners, that this is educational and informational. It's not intended to be therapeutic or providing health recommendations for anybody in particular. All right, so here's my outline. It's pretty robust. I've got about 130 slides in, oh, I don't know, 45 minutes. <laughs> So I'm going to speed up some slides and go quicker and uh, go slower on others. But first, I want to make the case for plants because many people will say, oh, but I know I need to eat fruits and vegetables. And I usually come back with a couple of different responses to that. First and foremost, I, I often say that it's not just about fruits and vegetables. We're talking about the entire plant spectrum as well as the color spectrum and the phytochemical spectrum. So I want you to think in terms of spectra, what you see behind me. I changed my screen just for this presentation today, as a matter of fact. So it's, it's not just about uh, the fruits and veggies. It's, it's really about how do we become more full spectrum in our everyday lives. And I do think, based on what I have seen 
tests play out in programs that I've offer, offered is that when people are eating more colorful foods, and I'm not talking about the food dye kind of foods, but the natural whole plant-based foods in nature, they start to live more colorfully. But right now, I do think that many people are taking in a relatively bland diet and not, uh, you know, I used to work with Dr. Jeffrey Bland. And so bland had a different connotation. When I'm talking bland here, I'm talking about lackluster, no color, it's white, brown, yellow, and uh, it, it's devoid of nutrient density. And so there are many cases where we see this play out in our culture. And time and time again, you know, I'd like to focus on the positive, but I do have to give us all a reality check that in general, we just come up too short. We come up too short. Doesn't matter where we live in the world, for the most part, industrialized societies, even though we might be so cutting edge in some ways, we are running ourselves ragged. And this is when we most need the help of plants and the intelligence of plants to really get in and configure our bodies differently. So less than 10% of most Western populations consume adequate levels of whole fruits and dietary fiber with typical intake being about half of the recommended levels. So if we just think about fiber for a second, and I'm in love with fiber, I have fallen in love with something that has become very ho-hum and mundane in our culture, but I think it's going through a renaissance. You know, the average American gets 15, one five grams of fiber per day. And that's about half of what we need, which is about, you know, 28 to 30 grams, depending on how many calories were taken in. But if you look at where we've been ancestrally, ancestrally, we have been people that have foraged from the land, eaten high amounts of fiber, lots of plants. You know, there was an estimate and um, there was an article some time ago that gave an estimate that on average, we would consume thousands of different varieties of plants. In our modern society, and most people rotate amongst the same types of plants, it's been estimated that our repertoire is somewhere between 100 to 300. So we've scaled it down. And I think for some people, they might just rotate among 10. So we're missing out for our gastrointestinal tract, right? And so um, we're, we're really seeing these, these changes play out in terms of chronic lifestyle-induced diseases. So we hear the Hippocrates phrase, food is medicine. And I would say that nature provides us with these colorful whole plant-based foods, which are much more specific in terms of their healing properties, right? So again, I'm not talking about this. Whenever I say rainbow diet, I always get the Skittles comment. So let's just be clear that we, we are talking about the beauty of plants. And as I reflect on all the different eating styles, I've been in nutrition for some time and it's a pendulum and the pendulum is always swinging, whether we go to the vegan vegetarian pendulum, the paleo, the keto, for a while we were, people were um, engaged with more of a carnivorous approach, but really and truly, when you look at the literature, the most well-studied diet is the Mediterranean diet, which features principles from all of these different eating styles, quite honestly. It is very integrative and very comprehensive. But you know, if we think ancestrally about our genes, what if you're not from the southern part of Europe? What if you don't have those genes? How do we need to be eating? What about Nordic ways of eating? What about the traditional Japanese diet? And I would say that no matter which dietary approach is of the day or of the moment, what I would say is that plants seem to be the ultimate eating unifier. There's so much division out there as it relates to food and eating. People are defining themselves by their diets. And one of the things that I would like us to move towards collectively, because I think it's more uh, engaging and it feels more comprehensive and feels like we're part of the collective is when we connect into plants. Every time we are having plants, it's like we're eating an entire universe of, of compounds. When I went to school to study nutrition, it was really about the macronutrients and the micronutrients. And then when I got into graduate school more exclusively and got assigned to a project on carotenoids, I realized that there is 
so much more than just the macros and the micros. There are so many of these different phytonutrients. And many times the average person doesn't have visibility into these because they're not on a food label. And as practitioners uh, know, there aren't really good quantification systems in terms of even laboratory tests. So yeah, you can give a blood sample and you can get some measures of certain carotenoids, one or two of them, but there are over 700 different carotenoids and that's just one class of phytochemicals. So it's difficult to get a sense of the complexity of food and how that translates into the body. But I do have a, uh, an appreciation for food synergy that there are many molecules within food and it's not just the food, it's how the food interacts with our body, with our gut microbiome. I, I just did a Facebook Live on soy and a lot of the misconceptions around soy, but soy on its own is, you know, if we look at the whole food form, it, it, it is often not even activated until it comes into contact with our gut microbiome to produce secondary metabolites, things like equal that then have an impact on bone and skin and breast and uh, hormones. So there's a synergy there within the food and then there's a synergy or, or a dynamism between the food and our bodies. And what I love about this organization is that in integrative medicine, we focus on holism, right? That plants in general, plant-based patterns can be healing. And then there's also a place where we can take more of a targeted approach to plants. And we've seen a lot of that even with the pandemic, looking at different protocols, talking about different therapeutic approaches to plants. And I would say that it's, it's almost like a, a tandem, right? We need the foundation of a pattern and we also need the targeted approach of certain actives at certain times for certain people. That's the personalized approach. When we look at the universe of plants and what we're taking in, so I mentioned that it's not just fruits and vegetables. Here's a, an abbreviated list of some of the, the players, uh, the stars within that universe. And I, I list them alphabetically, so I'm not favoring one or the other. Um, edible flowers, we look at fruits and herbs, legumes, nuts, seeds, spices, vegetables, whole grains. You know, one of the common questions I get, and I'm going to open this up for questions towards the end, but one of the common questions I get is, well, what if people can't afford fruits and vegetables? And I, that's on my mind as well, right? Because in many cases, eating fresh food requires effort. It requires resources. And that's where we start to pull in some of these other dried, concentrated forms of foods that can be very protective. And I think about spices. So I'm going to get into spices la later, and I'm also going to get into tea. Tea and spices, which are embraced by many cultures that have longevity, may be ways that we can help to reduce the impact, the financial impact of plants and uh, increase the medicinal impact. Now, one of the other things that I get as a uh, sometimes intended to be a showstopper whenever I talk about plants is the potential for anti-nutrients. What are anti-nutrients? Things like lectins and oxalates, goitrogens, phytoestrogens, phytates, tannins, these are some of them. So Weston Petrosky and I wrote and published a review paper on this and it is open access so everybody can get their hands on it. They can go through the paper because I really and truly wanted to take a neutral scientific approach to understand how problematic these compounds were for people. Uh, and is it really valid? Uh, do we need to be looking at measured intakes because of some risk? So when we went into each of these, and as you can imagine, there are many nuances to consider in different contexts and different study populations. I think one of the big ones on the radar today for many people is lectins. And so we, we definitely dove into lectins and I do think that for a subsection of the population that lectins can be problematic. If we look at Dr. Bajdani's work, which has been published in various journals, he's really the forerunner in, I would say, nutritional immunology, uh, that antibodies to lectins can be found in a certain percentage, 10 to 15% of blood samples. So the question I would ask is, why is this happening? Are the plants actually messengers 
that something is awry in our body chemistry. So maybe it's not anti-nutrients, but pro-messengers that these are, they're almost like symptoms would be to the body that we could detect that there's something awry. Perhaps plants are also signaling agents. The other thing I think about too, is that we're not eating a lot of the plant foods like they were consumed traditionally. So what I mean by that is cooking and boiling and roasting and soaking and fermenting. Fermentation is such a big deal right now. Not only do we get secondary metabolites, but we get different bacteria. And all of these processes that were known to be used traditionally are helpful in reducing a lot of these different compounds as well. And um, uh, on those heels, if people are sensitive and uh, obviously they have to work that out for themselves and um, for the practitioners listening, I, I think you'll appreciate the fact of how there's so much in the way of fear or um, I would say vigilance around eating to the point that people start to scale down the amount of foods that they're eating. So instead of having a larger repertoire of plant foods, now they have whittled it down to like five to seven. And I would say what I have seen scientifically is that smaller amounts of few seem to fare better than larger amounts of, um, I'm sorry, smaller amounts of many versus larger amounts of few would be the, the essence here that variety could be protective. All right, some of the newer benefits of plants. You know, when I studied, when I was in grad school in the 90s, one of the things that I studied as part of my master's thesis was oxidative stress and carotenoids. And at that time, it was all about antioxidants. There was a new journal that came out, free radicals in, in biology. And now we know that antioxidants are a bit 20th century as it relates to plants that we're moving beyond antioxidants to look at the individualized effects of different phytochemicals that are within plants that actually have structural, functional, even genomic effects. So there are the internal network, um, there, there's kind of the, the whole host of different things that these antioxidants can do for us just at the playing field of reducing free radicals. We can also stimulate through plants and through different compounds within plants are endogenous antioxidant defense enzymes, things like superoxide dismutase, catalase, glutathione peroxidase, enzymes that are involved with detoxification as well as aging. And then I also think one of the things I learned during graduate school is that having isolated doses of a single phytochemical can be disadvantageous. Nature works as a team. It's pleiotropic. It's, that's why you, you, you take a leaf of a plant and you can analyze hundreds, if not thousands of different compounds. But when humans take one of those compounds and isolate it and then put it into a pill in high amounts without all of the accompanying factors, that's where we might start to see changes. And, and we have seen that with antioxidant-like compounds that have started to look like pro-oxidants under certain doses and certain types of environments or milieus, especially as it relates to oxygen. One of the areas that I teach in, uh, as uh, Tabitha mentioned, is environmental health through the Institute for Functional Medicine. And as part of that teaching, what I bring out to the limelight is that we may not be able to offset the toxic burden that we're all confronted with because we, we need to drink water, we need to eat food, we need to breathe air. So we're going to have uh, a toxic load, but plants can be our buffer. And in fact, there's more data coming out to suggest that plants are an effective buffer against environmental toxicants. So if we keep the body aligned to being nutrient dense and nutrient sufficient, um, what can happen is then we don't see the oxidative stress from heavy metals. We don't see the uh, DNA damage to the same extent as when we don't have these nutrients. So keep this in mind as it relates to a detoxification type protocol. And, you know, here's the lesser known effect of plants that eating more fruits and vegetables has been associated with less psychological distress and better mood. As we all know, this is a big deal right now. 
that uh, mental health concerns are on the rise. People have greater sleep disturbance. They have greater depression and anxiety. And as you can see here, I listed just about five studies that would suggest that there are these beautiful scientific trends and observations and even um, you know, larger studies to suggest that there is a relationship here. There's an association between how we eat and how we feel. It's not just reducing the rates of chronic disease. We are also improving our psyche. And if we change the mind, we change our behavior. So it becomes this entire cycle. And if you look at this, this was taken from a paper on fruit and fiber. This is a great research paper. If you see the citation below, it's an open access journal. So many great types of tables and graphs to really make eating plant foods desirable from the aspect of the quality of life. And this particular one was in that paper showing that with each increase in fruit and vegetable servings, that there was an increase in life satisfaction. I mean, if you think about it, whether you're a practitioner or an educated consumer, customer, individual, I mean, we all want happiness, right? That's why we pay attention to health. So we have function, we can enjoy life. And to think that fruit and vegetables can be connected to life satisfaction, in my mind, is a big deal. So if we can find out what the motivating factor is for people to be healthy and to make change, and then start to bring in some of these plants. It's also um, connected into, I would say, empowerment. And I really love this study. The title of the study was Evolution of Well-Being and Happiness After Increases in Consumption of Fruits and Vegetables. To think that having up to eight servings per day of fruits and vegetables was associated with happiness, life satisfaction, and well-being. And you could say, well, you know, what does that really mean? Well, the authors went further into basically showing that it was the equivalent of going from unemployment to employment in terms of the psychological factor. So to think that we can get this just by eating plants, I think uh, is, is really significant, especially during this, this age that we live in, where there's a lot of stress. We have multiple things coming in to deal with. I also wanted to talk about seasonal eating. I, I do think that plants are indicators of our environment. Our environment then gets translated through our bodies. There are some really interesting studies. We don't have the time to go through these, but we're starting to see in, in certain animal studies how eating food out of season primes the phenotype, the presentation in a different way. And in some cases, eating summer type of food or eating food typically grown in the summertime uh, in the winter can lead to changes in metabolism and lead to changes in fat accumulation. So this was a, a really intriguing study. Again, I don't have the time to go through it, but it was looking at the consumption of oranges grown in different parts of the hemisphere given to rats at certain um, times where they were even, uh, they were mimicking either a long day, which would be summer or short day, which would be winter, and seeing these effects just uh, within a short time frame. So the, the seasonal effects may be playing a role. We're hearing a lot about chrononutrition, right? We hear about melatonin, we hear about the light dark cycle, and this is captured by plants. So when we are taking in plants within that particular season, it's priming our seasonal circadian rhythm, potentially at the level of the hypothalamus, which is the upstream factor for the rest of our endocrine system. So if we are eating foods out of season, this can lead to desynchronized metabolic outputs. I do think that, um, this is something we need to pay more and more attention to. And I think when we do this, we come more into balance with planetary health. Person health equals planetary health. And if we're eating foods in season, then we are in alignment with the rhythms of the planet. I also wanted to call out as far as uh, newer research, I'm gonna speed this up a bit so that I can get through my 130 slides. <laughs> 
that uh, food contains a lot of neuroactive substances. I, um, this is an intriguing article looking at hormones that are contained in foods. Uh, we've all known that um, the gut produces a number of different hormones, but we also get hormones from our food supply and many times from plants. You know, there's been so much fixation on soy and soy changing our estrogen. And, you know, I could go down a, a whole rabbit hole talking about that and the nuance behind that. But I just want to show how intelligent and connected plants are to our environment. They contain hormones, they contain neurotransmitters. And I do believe that they're changing our psychoneuroendocrine immune system through those different compounds. And we need more research on that to understand it. So in terms of mechanisms, I mentioned that plants are pleiotropic. They do a lot of things. They wear many hats. They can help. If, if you ever get lost in terms of plants and you just want a couple of bullet points to talk with patients or clients about, I would say it's mainly three things reducing inflammation and sensitizing the body to insulin and hormones and modulating stress. This is where we think of the word adaptogens. These are the three primary cellular mechanisms that we see. And I've also broken it out into a little bit more. You know, this might be interesting to explain to certain people who want to know more, right? The functional role that we might have something like carotenes, beta carotene converts a certain percentage to vitamin A. Structural, what we're learning is that certain of these phytochemicals make their way into certain parts of the body to have function, like lutein and, and zeaxanthin in the back of the eye playing a role in vision. They also play uh, intra, intracellular roles and in, in help with the relay race from outside of the cell to the inside of the cell and even through the nuclear membrane to the DNA. The gut microbiome, we're learning so much about this. It's no longer prebiotics and probiotics. We know that as a third leg of that, it's polyphenols. Polyphenols synergize the effects of prebiotics. DNA repair, talked about that in relationship to the antioxidant activity and of course epigenetics, which uh, again, each of these is like a lecture in and of itself. Like there's so much behind each of those. It's like the top of the iceberg. So how do you assess phytochemical intake, right? The goal, if you look at most of the leading opinion organizations is that we're aiming for five servings a day. What does that equate to? According to the dietary guidelines for Americans, it's 2.5 cups of vegetables. If we just think about that, you know, that's, it, it's still pretty modest, half a cup of cooked or one cup of leafy greens, it's not a lot. And um, most people still are not getting all of the colors. So there's a quantity issue, and then there's a quality issue. The quantity is the absolute number. The quality, it would be the colors or the phytonutrients that we're missing. So how do people know? As I mentioned, we don't see it on the nutrition facts label and the USDA nutrient database where you can find a lot of the levels of nutrients and foods doesn't really have all of the different phytochemicals broken out. So we are left with a chasm of our knowledge and what we would like to see and what we know about from the science and then the practical application in the, the arena of food. So I'm gonna give you basics. I'm gonna give you things to be looking at in the absence of those things. So here's a phytochemical family tree taken from this article below, which is also, oops, also open access. Um, I just want to call your attention to a couple of things here, because I know that for practitioners, sometimes there's like a sea of phytochemicals. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't keep all these straight. I think that um, all the way to the far right here, carotenoids are the ones that I was talking about. These tend to be fat soluble. And then let's go to the other side, to the far left, the phenolics. These get a lot of attention. The phenolics break out into other, its own family tree, as you can see here. We're hearing a lot about flavonoids, right? We're hearing a lot about flavonoids. And under the flavonoid little mini family tree here, if you can go down with me to the anthocyanidins. Anthocyanidins, we think of the pro-anthocyanidins, the purple, the, the types of pigments found in uh, blue-purple foods, which we are falling way too short on. Um, the isoflavonoids flavones, which we find in soy and in other foods, um, are also part of that kingdom. 
So it's not to say that the sulfur compounds aren't important, but for the sake of this presentation, I would say the carotenoids and the phenolics are like the heavy hitters and you know about 700 within each category. And again, we're only seeing the very skeleton without all the flesh of all of the different composites. So one of the things that I think will be forthcoming, some I'm, I'm going to also present kind of like a more novel, what I think is on the horizon. I think we're going to see a dietary phytochemical index emerging. We're already seeing, in, seeing it in the science and many times the science translates into clinical application in years to come. Uh, we have a glycemic index, so imagine a phytochemical index, it's already being used. The higher the phytochemical index, the greater the amount of plant compounds in the diet. There's also in the literature being discussed a dietary diversity score. So with greater variety or diversity, we're seeing lots of health benefits. So even if your patient or client can't increase the amount of fruits or vegetables or plant-based foods, what I would say is just encourage variety because variety typically confers greater nutrient status, has health benefits for blood pressure, oxidative damage. I wish I could take you through some studies um, on that front because the, the literature on dietary variety as a standalone concept is worth like a whole day seminar. There are so many studies. This is not just the, the, the studies that I have at the bottom. There are so many different ones. So adding just one food or one spice, something novel has been shown to have significant physiological impact. I looked um, just last month as far as uh, dietary diversity score, 417 publications on PubMed. Uh, and again, we're seeing this emerge with respect to the gut microbiome. And in fact, uh, the gut microbiome thrives on diversity. I mean, this is also some social commentary as well, right? Why is diversity just coming to the surface? I think from a planetary and a person perspective, there's something to be said about the element of diversity and how healing it is. The more diverse the microbiome, the more adaptable it will be. So this is something that I've had on my Facebook page before, just again, calling out the diversity of gut health actives, prebiotics, probiotics, and don't forget the polyphenols, which are really uh, coming into this whole gut health discussion by way of creating more diversity in microorganisms. There's also, um, you know, I've been tracking the lexicon around plants, right? And, and about how we measure things. Botanical diversity scores also being used in the literature. And I find that this is an interesting statistic that there, there's of course like the, the whole data set around American gut. So people that have been tracking with the gut microbiome over years. And one of the patterns that the researchers found was greater short chain fatty acid fermenters were associated with eating greater than 30 plant types per week compared to less than 10. We want short chain fatty acid fermentation. We want the butyrate to be formed in the gut. Some people even take supplemental butyrate because of this ripple effect through the gut, through the immune system, through the cell signaling effects that it creates. So just through the American gut data, we can see that aiming for at least 30 plant types per week can help with the production of greater short chain fatty acids. Uh, we also see immune resilience with more food diversity, especially in children. The earlier that diverse foods are started uh, in life, the, the more favorable the outcome for that child as an adult uh, in terms of having reduced incidence of allergy or different allergic or autoimmune diseases. So again, I have a lot of passion around this area. Um, this is a dietary variety tracker on the left created by Miguel Toribio Mateus, a colleague and friend of mine in the UK who is a gut microbiome researcher. And his 50 food challenge gave me the idea to then put together a variety tracker based on the food categories. And by the way, you can get all of this at the deannaminick.com site. There is a download where you could just download a lot of this just as a free, you know, to use with, for yourself or with people. So during the pandemic, uh, one of the things I've been featuring is just how do you implement 
variety? What does it look like on the plate? And um, it's really fun to have that type of challenge and, and to look at food as art, right? That just the beautiful colors and the variety of all these things coming together. When we look at the phytochemical index and couple that to dietary diversity as a score, um, we get a better intake of quality and quantity. And again, I, I have keyed into working with uh, one particular group with an app where eventually what we're gonna see is you take a picture of your food and then that food is populated with respect to its nutrients. And then you can see a complete printout. It's not perfect right now, but there are different apps that are being done to do that, to use visual analog um, scales and then to translate that and quantify it in some way. I also think that we can create a color density index. I talk about this in my article below, uh, which I would encourage you all to, to get if you can. It's an open access article. There was also this about um, colors of food being associated with antioxidant level. In other words, the deeper the hue, especially red, blue, and purple foods, the greater the antioxidant capacity. Uh, and so that's one other practical application is to, in the grocery store, at the farmer's market, wherever food is being selected, to look for the deeper hue of food because that often denotes greater concentration of phytonutrients, not always, but in general. So I'm not gonna take you through this color density index. You can read about it in my paper below. Um, I'm also very interested in personalization. Much of what I'm speaking about is a public health message in terms of getting people to have more plants. I do think that as we move forward with the science that we'll be able to tailor phytochemicals to people's personalized needs. And I think that we can already kind of do that. I'm going to show you how I did that in the scientific paper that I wrote in the Journal of Nutrition and Metabolism, which again, you can download this. I wrote it with clinicians in mind. I didn't want an overly sciencey paper. I just wanted enough science to support why eating the rainbow is a justified message. In fact, I was just interviewed by a BBC journalist to ask the question, is a colorful diet a healthier diet? And I guess it depends how we define color. But in this case, <laughs> I'm again, thinking of whole food colors. So this is uh, the article in a nutshell. If I showed you nothing else, um, this would be the graphic image um, to summarize what I was talking about. So each of the colors of food, the, the classes, I have listed in the paper. And what I did is I looked at the colors in more of a sciencey way. So I looked for pattern recognition. I know that nature doesn't play in hard boxes or in categories, but if we were just to look at the clustering of the science, what would those colors and the foods that contain that color or that pigment, what would they represent? And in general, what I found was that red foods were connected to immunity. So through their anti-inflammatory activity, you know, red is about inflammation, right? On the, on the pro-inflammatory side, but Red foods can also be anti-inflammatory. And I, I list some of the active compounds. Orange, I connected to reproductive health through beta carotene, progesterone, looking at the endocrine modulation that can happen, even ovulation. We see um, up to 14 different carotenoids have been identified in the ovary. And so that's interesting to me. I don't think we understand why there's a concentration of so many different carotenoids. We know that beta carotene converts to vitamin A. We know that vitamin A is required for the genomics of ovulation, but what about the other carotenoids? Are they serving a functional role? Uh, yellow, I'm connecting into the gut because of the catalytic activity of some of the, of the citrus bioflavonoids, um, the alkalinization effect, some of the fibrous effects. Green connects to the heart. And primarily if we think of green leafy vegetables, what we see is folates and vitamin K, which phylloquinone, I, I, I often say that uh, vitamin K is the next vitamin D. And we, I even have a blog on this. And I, I start to draw parallels between uh, vitamin D as more of a hormonal type of agent in the body and vitamin K having very similar effects. And then blue-purple being the brain. 
And in fact, we could do, uh, maybe Tabitha will have me back to do a whole other lecture just on blue purple foods. Uh, I've done this before where I just go narrow and deep into one color to show the plethora of science and how the components within those specific colors of food are connected into those functions. So I'm going to, I'm just aware of time here. Um, I'm gonna whiz through, this will be a very quick and you can always, you know, I, I talk about these topics all the time, um, but I wanna give you a sense. I wanna give you some takeaways here. So quickly going through the rainbow, I mentioned red already connected to inflammation. There are different compounds that make these red colored foods more anti-inflammatory. I listed here the color, the fruits, the vegetables, select phytochemicals, what are the physiological effects? Then I, what I did in the paper is I just teased apart some of the hallmark foods that are representative of that category going into tomatoes. Now, tomatoes is kind of a double-edged sword. It can be seen as pro-inflammatory for some people, for me <laughs> even. Um, I don't react well to tomatoes. I actually start to look like a tomato if I eat tomatoes. So red inflammation, histamine response. But it, what's really interesting is that many of these red colored foods are also high in vitamin C. So perhaps the antidote to some of that histamine is also contained within the food if we're eating it in whole food form. Not all the time, but could be. Strawberries are also pretty high in histamines, but they contain a lot of anti-inflammatory polyphenols. We tend to think of fisetin, um, but they have been shown to be anti-inflammatory in a variety of different studies, uh, even some clinical trials. Beets, which are rich in beta lanes, which can be important for reducing inflammation. There are some clinical trials, just a few on that, I would say. Cherries, think gout, right? And cherries are also a great source of melatonin, help with insomnia. Um, but definitely tart cherry juice is something that we just, even at my home, we have as a mainstay medicine in the refrigerator. Orange, reproductive health, so many things to say about orange. Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, again, I mentioned ovulation, fat soluble an antioxidants, the family of carotenoids, and I'm only showcasing a handful of them here. They don't they look like fatty acids, right? This should make you think, oh, that looks like an omega-3 fat. It kind of does, and they work together. And one helps the absorption of, of the other. We need the omega-3 and we need the, the long chain fats to help with the absorption of these carotenoids or even short chain fats. So the way that I see the red, orange, yellow, and think of autumn when the, the leaves start to break down in the chlorophyll and you start to see the revealing of carotenoids. So the lesson there is when we eat green leafy veggies, we're also getting in some of those red, orange, yellow carotenoids that are protective in the body. I mentioned that carotenoids are identified in ovarian tissue. That was a citation for that. And again, just summarizing for you at a snapshot, color, what are the fruits, what are the vegetables, select phytochemicals, physiological effects. And again, there's so much under each of these. And I showcase this all in the article that I'm listing below. I talk about wild yam. I talk about carrots being connected to uh, even looking at hormone metabolism orange fruits. This is what I would say the underdog of nutrition, beta cryptoxanthin, which is rich in orange spherical fruits, things like peaches and persimmons and tangerines and mandarins, um, copious amounts of beta cryptoxanthin, which seems to play a role in ovarian health and even in body composition. I'm so excited about them, especially because where I live, they're in season. Uh, there is, are some studies looking at um, some of these associations with beta cryptoxanthin, and one of them here is looking at lower risk of endometriosis. Um, and the researchers found that beta cryptoxanthin was thought to explain the association between the citrus fruit consumption and the 22% lower endometriosis risk. And um, this is a very interesting study, in my opinion, looking at how having beta cryptoxanthin connected to fruit can help to reduce ovarian decline. Um, 
so interesting. I made this whole graphic after getting into the research. I get so like artfully stimulated to like, okay, we need to get this out there. <laughs> Orange fruits for the ovaries, right? So um, that's just even if that's your one pearl from this this quick Facebook live and webinar, uh, I'd be happy. So again, I'm just detailing here some of the work on beta cryptoxanthin. We know that the carotenoids get into the fat parts of the body. So the adipose tissue, the epidermis, the breast tissue, the brain, the ovary. So um, they can be protective and they can also alter the skin color a little bit. Yellow is digestion. Uh, and I mentioned kind of the functional signature, the color code as I refer to it. So the fruits, vegetables, and many times you're going to find yellow in green foods. They're not always just outright yellow, but in the article, I do talk about ginger and the connection to the gut, to the fire element. I talk about lemons and bioflavonoids and also the liver. I mean, look at the liver, the bilious, the bile, which is this green yellow, right? And many of these foods also stimulate bile, not all of them, but, um, that green yellow type of color seems to be consistent. Pineapple, which helps um, and, and contains enzymes to break down protein. And uh, bananas and plantains can contain pro prebiotic fibers. And in fact, many people aren't aware of this, but some of the highest serotonin containing foods, and if we think of serotonin as the happy neurotransmitter, um, yellow foods are up high. Uh, on, on the list. So plantains are number one, pineapples, bananas are up there. So yellow in general, when they've done psych psychology type of studies and surveys, they have found that um, yellow is the, the color of happiness for people in general. So the only reason I'm calling out the serotonin is more or less the, yes, the, the call to mental health, but also the very interesting connection to serotonin content. So you could see here what I just said about plantains, pineapple, banana being top for serotonin. We don't know, however, if people eat more of those foods, if they become happier. But I've always found it interesting that a banana is like a smile. It's just, or I guess you could say it's like a frown too, but I like to think of it as a smile. Saffron helping with metabolic syndrome, a lot of the metabolic aspects. Some of the plant compounds are doing what we call beijing, which is heating up or creating more metabolic or mitochondrial activity. So when I think of the fire element in the body, I think of the digestive tract and I think of how can we change, yeah, the, the, the fiery uh, metabolism through plants. And then we move into the cool green of the heart. And when I think of green foods, I think of expansion. I think of opening those blood vessels with dietary nitrates, which are typically found in uh, a number of the leafy greens, potassium, magnesium, folate. I mean, the natural counterpart to hemoglobin is chlorophyll, right? I mean, if we want to be aligned with vitality to be getting in our greens. And fortunately, we have, out of all the colors, we have the most, food, if we look at plant foods, we have uh, green as the, I would say the majority. Like blue purple is, is the, where we see the least amount of plant foods. Green is where we see the majority of plant foods. So that is probably, that's a very good thing from what I can see in terms of what they do. They're binders or fibers. They eliminate, they methylate. They enable our cardiovascular system to stay supercharged, so to speak, right? So I, I have a short list here, but look at all, I mean, these are just some token phytochemicals to be looking at. And uh, the chelation aspect, so drawing out what we no longer need. And I look at this in a more symbolic, metaphorical aspect as well. This is just looking in the gut. The green represents the chlorophyll binding uh, to agents that don't need to be there. You know, when we think about detoxification, one of the first steps is to remove, to prevent the agents from being absorbed. And so many times taking in plants is that built-in mechanism for carrying things out that we don't want to be there. So in the article, I go into spinach. I talk about dietary sources of nitrates. If you look at the very bottom, you see the, um, the very high sources of nitrates. Why do we care about nitrates? They help to convert to nitric oxide, which is the, um, the, the gas that enables us to expand. 
And so it's important to be getting in dietary nitrates. Uh, cruciferous vegetables, that's a, a whole lecture in and of itself, all of the many variety of different organosulfur compounds. An avocado, I just wanna um, shine a light on this beautiful fruit, which if we had a whole avocado, uh, we get roughly 9.2 grams of fiber. Now keep in mind again, if our daily allotment is about 30 grams, to think that you're getting almost a third of your daily requirement from an avocado. Many people don't think of an avocado in relationship to fiber. They think of fat when they think of an avocado, but you get copious amounts of fiber. You get a lot of potassium as well. In fact, you get more potassium with a uh, whole avocado. Now I'm showing the half avocado stats here. But many people think that a banana is, is high in potassium, but really an avocado has a number of different things that are incredible for heart health, what I'm really speaking to here. And there are publications on it. Dr. Dave Heber at UCLA did this fantastic study. I think I talk about it every time I get the chance when I'm talking about plants. So he, he had people eat a hamburger and basically measured postprandial levels of different inflammatory cytokines like IL-6 and found that indeed eating a hamburger on its own led to increases, subtle increases in interleukin-6. However, when an, a half of an avocado was put on that burger, the, the, the rise in IL-6 was flatlined by the addition of that half avocado. So it's about eating smarter. You might have patients who say, I'm going to have that grilled burger. You can't tell me otherwise. And then all you can say was, well, bring in some greens bring in some chlorophyll, bring in um, something to complement and bring down some of the, the negatives of what you might be getting. We don't wanna, I think it's important to enjoy food. You know, I come from a background of a lot of restrictions. So I, I'm trying to be attentive to that and try to keep the balance of educating, but then also inspiring as to, you know, just what they could be doing. So we'll end on blue purple foods. Blue purple is special. Um, I'm curious how many of you, maybe you can chat it in, how many of you like this color? In fact, write your favorite color on here. Uh, I often think that, um, you know, th there's something special to be said when a color doesn't occur so often in nature, it becomes precious, it comes out at certain times. And perhaps it's more, even more uh, therapeutic because we just get smaller doses. So they, they might be more therapeutic. And when I see, purple carrots in the market next and alongside of the orange carrots. I'm always choosing the purple. And I, my mantra is when I see purple, I choose purple. Purple's not even my favorite color. My favorite color is really green, but I like all the colors for different reasons. But when I see purple, I'm choosing it. And the reason why is if you look at these carrots, even though they're thinner, um, they, 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 they taste better and they tend to be two to three times more nutrient dense. This is like you're getting built-in nutrient density with this food. And in fact, I was just showcasing on Facebook this morning that I just bought purple tortillas that are gluten-free, made from cassava, and they're purple because of the purple carrots and purple cauliflower. It's a genius product. Um, I, I found them at Sprouts. So purple cauliflower, again, you know, anytime we can choose purple, these Brussels sprouts, you know, look at that. That looks like the universe, you know, again, we're eating this incredible intelligence that nature provides. This is sacred geometry right here, right? And all the purple interwoven with the green. So what about blue purple? Well, when people aren't getting blue purple, I start to think about their brain and I think about their mood. And I, I started this, this whole webinar talking about how we modulate mental health through fruits and veggies. But if I were to create one color for modulating more than the other, it would be blue purple. There's a preponderance of evidence to suggest both clinical evidence and even in healthy people. Healthy people um, given blue purple foods seem to be able to improve certain markers of brain health, which is pretty fantastic because that doesn't always happen. Usually studies are done in diseased or symptomatic populations. So here's a short list of some of the fruits which are if you live in the Pacific Northwest or it's summer where you're at, I'm sure you might have access to some of these. Vegetables, whenever you can get the purple variety, encourage your patients, your clients to get the purple because they're getting the 
the host of different anthocyanidins, the proanthocyanidins. These are marker compounds that find their way into the brain and are helpful for learning, memory, and mood. So in the paper, I talk about Concord grape juice even. Uh, so yeah, I'm a fan of juice, uh, not a lot of it, but I do think that complementing it with a meal uh, can be beneficial, right? And at least the studies in grape juice that I've seen are pretty convincing. There's a whole um, host of studies on blueberries and the equivalent seems to be about half a cup per day for people, which is very modest. The smaller the berry, the better. And there are so many studies, I can't even list them all on this slide, but in terms of what they're doing, they're helping the nerve cells, they're elevating um, brain-derived neurotropic factors, so they're helping with neuronal growth, um, they're helping with positive affect and mood in children and, and young adults. If there's any food that should be at schools, it should be blueberries. And as I mentioned about purple carrots, here's the data to support the increased nutrient density. So I wanna leave you with final slides on tools. And I've already supplied Tabitha and Jess with a link so that you, you all can download this three-part, I would say toolkit for however to use uh, in your practice or even personally. So the first part of it is just the why, the what, the how, the where, to give people the intellectual justification for eating more plants. And then the second is more the action step of what I might call loosely rainbow bingo. This has been used by kids, it's been used by families, it's been used by adults, just tracking a color per day. You know, making eating fun rather than all analysis, paralysis, nutritional, and thinking of food as medicine all the time. Food is also art. So bringing that out through the conduit of color. And then the third part is this shopping list. So it's a shopping list that's segmented according to color category. And you're going to see that I've also included brown, tan, and white foods as well. Uh, so I don't talk about them in the paper because there's, um, yeah, just not as much in the way of like data and patterns there, but I do include them on the shopping list. So that's the toolkit, the, the info, the action, and then the shopping list to make it happen. And if you're a practitioner, there are indirect labs that you can always be looking at to see whether or not people have sufficient nutrients. I'm gonna be talking more about this in some talks this, this, um, these coming months. And then, um, you know, how do we diversify and maximize, right? Spices and teas and foraging. And this summer, I, it was too, I live on five acres of property and it was just too overwhelming for me to do a massive garden. So I ended up doing more herbs on my deck, <laughs> which, you know, you, you've got to do whatever you can. And it was so satisfying just to have herbs in my, my daily meals, but variety, variety, everybody, I, I hope that you, you all can be the beacons of light to get this message out about variety. I, I can't um, tout this enough, how smaller amounts of many phytochemicals may have greater beneficial effects than larger amounts of fewer comes from the work of um, so many different people out there saying that. Get spices. Spices are concentrated amounts of plants. Careful with spices, get them in glass bottles. Um, don't keep them too long. They can harbor mycotoxins and other contaminants, but they are medicinal. I did add this about how to get spices. I'm not gonna tour you through because I'm sure you've got lots of ideas on your own as well. Uh, you know, sometimes a smoothie, if the weather and the, the season permits. Tea. I'm drinking tea here with me right now. I have a green tea. Tea, in some cases, can be even higher in certain phytochemicals than a serving of veggies. And it's more accessible to people. It's pennies per cup. And so this, from a financial standpoint, gives you greater nutrient density for um, less financial expenditure. And I have here the rainbow of teas. Most people will just drink one. The most well-studied tea is the green tea uh, segment, much like the Mediterranean diet. In the tea world, it's green tea, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't have oolong and uh, gosh, a jasmine tea, herbal teas, so many different benefits from all of them. And here's the study that I just spoke to talking about how, if you look at this first bar up here, 
So the blue is the minimum, the orange is the maximum. This is the antioxidant potential. Look at tea. Look at tea relative to some of these other plant foods. It's far in a way, it's, it's staggering how much you can get from a cup of tea. Soups and sauces and broths, um, different meals to bring together all, the, all of these different plant foods. And I also have here combinations for synergy. And most of all, make it fun, connect with a community that it, so that it becomes much more colorful, um, a diverse community to celebrate that diverse meal, right? And I'll leave you with something inspirational. And I saw this quote in, a, uh, in the David Jones grocery store when I was in Sydney, Australia. And it says, don't eat vegetables because they are good for you. Eat them for one reason alone, because they are gorgeous. And we know that they are. They make us the rainbow we are. So I'm going to end here, Tabitha. I know I went a bit uh, to the top of the hour. So I'm, I'm happy to stay over and to take some questions as you would like. If there so are we, would love, we would love to stay over a little bit if you are willing. Um, what a wonderful presentation, Deanna, honestly. Oh, <laughs> well, I'm passionate about it. I mean, I'm on a mission of nutrition for sure. And I feel like there's no better time than now to really just be talking about the low hanging fruit of what we could be doing, which is eating more fruit and vegetables and plants in general, right? I mean, I yeah, just such a wonderful presentation. And um, I found myself smiling more than I think I ever have in a scientific, you know, I mean, just you, you blend that science and, and, um, and nature so beautifully. So thank you. It really was wonderful. Thank you. We have lots of questions. Um, and I would like to just really thank you for making that connection between, um, you know, just all that is happening around diversity in our world right now in, in um, just our cultural kind of need to, to confront how we need to bring more diversity into everything we do. And then that also in the natural world, that is a positive thing. Um, that was so beautiful. And as you know, we're, we're so committed to that. Um, our annual conference is People, Planet, Purpose. And we're really just looking at you know, that, um, that connection back to our planet. So that was really beautiful. Um, one of the questions we have from uh, Greg Snow, who's one of our organizational members from Palmer College of Chiropractic is yeah. um, curious about your thoughts on those with food sensitivities, gluten, soy, et cetera, and pulsing to attempt to improve or mitigate negative responses to the food, allowing for greater diversity of intake. Um, thank you. That's Any comments question. around that? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Snow. If um, by the way, I love. I, I went to Augustana College, which is right by Palmer College, uh, so I have a connection there. Uh, yeah, so I, I do think that there can be parallel tracks where you can work on the dysfunction or whatever's happening in the body, and concurrently be exploring these things through potentially an elimination diet, and then start starting to add things back in in small amounts to see how the body registers that signal. Uh, you know, I think we learn a lot about ourselves when we abstain from food and then come back into it, whether it's uh, more of a physiological response, even our mood can change. And I would encourage us all to even be thinking about um, how our mood changes when we eat certain foods. You know, do we lose energy? Do we gain energy? But to that question, I would say, yes, um, absolutely. We, we, there are intolerances, sensitivities, and food allergies that are pervasive. And for some time, we may have to abstain from certain foods. And the, the good thing about nature is that nature provides us with a broad palate. So it's not even that if we have to eliminate tomatoes, like I have to do, this is something that even goes back to childhood for me, that I can't do other red colored foods, right? So um, we have many options within a food category. But I would be exploring the why. You know, um, Tabitha, as you know, I mean, we're, we're all about root cause. Like, why is there this sensitivity, right? Let's look deeper into it. Is it the form of the food? Is it the quality of the food? Is it the amount of the food? Is it the food coupled with something else that is exacerbating the response in the body? Maybe we need to work on the gut. You know, so many different paths up that mountain. But it's a, it's a really good question. I do think that micropulsing can be one dietary strategy that doesn't make people as stressed. It makes them feel like, oh, I can have a little bit of everything 
just not large amounts so that I'm creating a response in the body that is unfavorable. And I really love that it really makes me think about the, the mental shift from a philosophy of diversity and inclusion versus a philosophy of other, and this is bad, and I need to get this out of my, right? Like it's, it's just a very different approach because, you know, having, um, you know, I'm a naturopathic doctor and the, the approach, there are lots of approaches around elimination that is very strict and restrictive um, and that all or nothing type of approach. And I, I do think that that can be very stressful for many people, um, you know, when, when there could be other strategies like you're suggesting. So I really appreciate that, Deanna. Yes. Thank you for mentioning that. It, it's so true. I mean, I didn't mention this, but I have an eating disorder background and a lot of that came from restriction. So I grew up with a mom who, uh, you know, we could only have certain things and uh, there was a lot of fear and a lot of phobia and um, it just made me want more of the things that I couldn't have. And then I would binge, mm -hmm. I would binge, and then I would have all kinds of symptoms uh, so anyway, I, I do think that there's a psychological and a physiological cascade that can happen around that. Yeah, yeah I've, I've, I've seen that as well. So thank you for sharing that. Um, another question, do we know the relationship of the anti-nutrients with the microbiome? So again, goes back to more personalized approach. That is a very fertile area of discovery and I would say research. I don't even think we know enough about the gut microbiome. Right. Right. We're really <laughs> and people who are researchers on the gut microbiome would actually tell you that. So um, I'd like to understand the gut microbiome, the skin microbiome, and all of the different facets of the microbiome. And then we have the dance with food and food compounds, right? I mean, there are layers and layers here to explore. So I don't claim to, to know any, any definitive guidance or wisdom uh, or you know how to even guide people on that because I think we're still in discovery mode quite honestly. Great. We had another question and comment um, from Janelle McKinley about your powerful comment around po polyphenols synergizing the effects of prebiotics. Could you give some more examples or elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, so if we think of a prebiotic fiber, so something like chicory or plantains, uh, psyllium, any number of things, and we start to foster a certain population of microorganisms. Well, the microorganisms are leveraging the prebiotics, but then when we have the polyphenols come in, we can create other metabolites. And again, I, I don't claim to have definitive uh, a, a sense of what exactly happens, but you can just even see it in the literature, what's happening with discussion around prebiotics and polyphenols, that having those two things together might actually propel the gut further and in a, in a better direction than anyone on its own. It's again, the diversity message, right? right. Like let's bring in the diversity of plants with the diversity of fiber so fibers are going to be a very distinct class, right? We're talking insoluble, soluble fibers. And then I'm talking polyphenols, which have different types of compositions that, you know, if we think of the flavonoids, right? So they're, they're complementary, but not necessarily looking the same as fiber. So there's an interplay. There's even an interplay of those two things in plants. So we're just bringing that dynamism into the body. Okay, another question, are bananas, pineapples, and plantains the plants that contain the highest serotonin or are they just the best fruits for serotonin? Good question. For that study, which is quite an old study, they actually contain serotonin. Great. Yeah, but what we don't know, and I just wanna make clear that this is um, not yet defined, and this is a great research project for a student somewhere, is to see whether or not people fed those foods get a translation in mood. Right. Wouldn't you want to know like, okay, yes. if I have a banana a day, am I actually changing serotonin levels that impact my, my neurochemistry? We don't know that. So we just know that those amounts of serotonin were identified in those foods. Great. Um, thank you for, this is from Tracy McMillan. Thank you for this brilliant presentation. I noticed you didn't mention organic or bi biodynamic versus conventionally grown. 
Good as point. far as phytochemical value, do you have any tips on coaching this topic with clients? That's an oversight on my part. I, I needed to include that. Usually in my detoxification um, type of presentations, I include discussion about organic food being lower in pesticide, insecticide, herbicide residues, and also being more uh, favorable in nutrient quantities. So yes, thumbs up to both of those things. I haven't seen much in the way of literature on biodynamic uh, gardening, but intuitively it makes sense because it's more in alignment with growing and gardening and earth patterns and seasonal eating and moon cycles. You know, it all makes sense to me. Um, so yes, uh, I, I think that was Tracy's question. I, I definitely would advocate those two things. It's just that oftentimes there's an expense yes. for organic. And I don't want that to be a deal breaker for people where they feel like, oh, then I just can't eat fruits and vegetables. It's that access issue, right? It's a yes. big, big, big deal. Um, yeah. Deborah Wright asks, I'm interested to know your thoughts on plant foods, uh, plant foods from different countries as it relates to phytonutrient content. I am in New Zealand and just wondering if there's any data on this or anyone looking at that. You know, there are different researchers from different parts of the world looking at their foods of interest. And what I also find really interesting is that there are different spice uh, composites from all over the world, right? So when you're in Japan versus when you're in the Middle East versus when you're in India um, and perhaps even New Zealand, I haven't seen anything specifically to New Zealand, but um, yes, indeed. And, and in fact, I would really encourage people to start to explore the ancestral ways of eating that align to not just their gene variants, but their ancestral patterns. Like what did their ancestors have and explore that? Because I think it, uh, it can bring up a lot of things for people. Um, and I've done that exercise with people and it's, it can be very healing to focus on the foods of their ancestors, having a different understanding of, um, just meal preparation and, and food is energy. Food really creates a lot of uh, memories for us. So I think tapping into that uh, is, is profound for people. And yeah, there, there is definitely science uh, from different parts of the world. I just can't speak to New Zealand in particular, but I know that New Zealand is the country that I think of when I'm thinking of purity on products, supplemental products coming out of New Zealand for sure. <laughs> Great. Um, I know this is a great question from Gina Hamilton Buttock. Um, can you talk about the loss of food nutritional content of plants and fruits over the decades due to depleted soils, pesticides, et cetera? Yeah, it is very sad, which is why um, when people ask me about supplementation, whether or not that's warranted, and they say, well, Deanna, you're promoting eating a plant-based diet. Can I get everything that I need? And I say, well, that depends on who you are, where you live, what your toxic burden is. And we're not growing food in the same soil that we've had. And uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the documentary, Kiss the Ground, but I think it really drives home regenerative agriculture, looking at the soil composition, the changes that we're seeing on the planet. And um, this is all impacting us, right? And so, yes, I, I love this question, although it saddens me to think about that we are losing nutrient density. What does this say about us as people? Are we losing some of this? And then we become much more vulnerable to the effects of what it's being replaced with. So this is why oftentimes supplementation um, or even bringing in the plants in greater proportions would be important. So yes. And where do we start with that? Yesterday, I did a short video just showing my compost, right? And so getting back to the soil, getting back to growing those plants and bringing in the microorganisms. This is why fermented, uh, fermentation and fermented foods can be important because we start to replace some of the microorganisms. But um, yeah, I'm most concerned, Tabitha, uh, about minerals, quite honestly. Um, minerals are... I mean, so many people are in love with magnesium, right? It's used for 300 plus reactions in the body. Minerals compete with heavy metals. They have the same chemical structure. They're divalent cations. So magnesium is plus two, iron is plus two, but so is lead. Lead is plus two, mercury is plus two. So they're gonna compete for receptors and for um, 
Deborah says she's obsessed with mineral. I am too. I, I'm a mineral kind of person. And when I'm thinking of soils, I'm that's one of the first things that I'm thinking about, not just the microorganisms, but also the mineral composition. And if we lose minerals, we become more vulnerable to the effects of heavy metals. Yes. And that is something that um, you know, we're really looking at as well, just with all of the, um, the need to really, as integrative clinicians, be well-trained in uh, environmental medicine. It, it, it's just, it's an absolute necessity in today's day and age. So I really appreciate that work that you're doing as well. Mm -hmm. We're all connected into this. It takes the, the planet to, to get us back on track, that's for sure. So we're only gonna be able to take one more question. Um, there's so many, but um, I just thought it'd be nice to end on um, from Maria Colin uh, Gonzalez. How do we start to best, um, how do we best start to incorporate some of these nuggets in very resistant patients? Like what are some of your strategies um, for those folks who, you know, because they're higher in carbs or sugar, they might not want to eat a specific type of fruit or, or um, veg or more fruits, I, I would say. Okay. So I have a couple of uh, strategies up my sleeve on that one. You know, sometimes you can start with more of a, um, a non-food discussion and just ask, what is your favorite color? You know, just start talking about color, right? Mm -hmm. And then from that conversation, and that people, hands down, I, I've always had the experience where people, they know exactly what colors they like. They know what colors they don't like. And, and oftentimes I'll say, well, it just depends. And I'll say, well, what about in the moment? Just what colors are you drawn to? What colors are you wearing? What about your home? What colors are in your home? What colors are in your closet? Like in my closet, I have them by rainbow, right? So I'm just curious about other people. And then I'll get into, well, what colors do you have in the refrigerator? Take a picture of your refrigerator. Let's look at the colors in your refrigerator. So what I would say is go light and connect, connect, connect. Lots of open-ended questions. Talk about color, which is a universal for many people. It, it's been told to me that even people who are blind um, can feel or sense color. Color is a powerful vehicle that can unite us. You know, we see a stop sign, we see red, we know to stop. You know, we, we focus on the blue sky, the green plants, you know, we, we there, there's something about the colors we wear. Um, so I would say to go with that. And then you start to focus on, I, I remember years and years ago, I did a fun workshop with everybody in a circle and I give everybody a, um, a box of crayons and I had them write down what they had for dinner the night before. And then they had to take the crayon <laughs> out and then just put stripes of color on the food and then look at their food as art, not to analyze it for nutrition. Like I didn't want anybody to get into that discussion because in order to make change, I feel like you have to be inspired. It has to be heart. That's it can't right. only be mind, you know, emotion, emotions are drivers for humans, right? We move towards passion and we move away from pain. So if we can create something fun and engaging and say, oh my gosh, look at all this red, or I don't have any purple and purple is my favorite color. Let's do a purple challenge, you know, make it fun and engaging. I feel like that works for kids. It works for a 70 to 80 year old. It works for everybody right. in between. Try that out. And then you're shifting from what you can't do to what you can do, right? It's a, it's a totally different type of conversation. Absolutely. Really beautiful. Really beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Deanna. This was just brilliant. And yes, to your earlier question, we would love to have you back anytime on any <laughs> topic. Um, so please, we can connect with that um, offline, but thank you um, so much. So what's upcoming, uh, just to give you all who are still with us, um, on September 3rd, we'll be connecting with Joshua Rubenstein, who's a naturopathic doctor, wonderful presenter. So excited to have him. Um, and he'll be talking about whole, can you just go back really quick to that slide for one minute? Um, whole body approach to low back pain. So really encourage you to all, um, you can register for that event and um, come to that webinar on September 3rd. I'd also like to invite you to our People Planet Purpose Conference, which will be happening um, both in person and online um, October 29th to 31st. And we'll be back at Paradise Point in San Diego. Um, our 
conference this year is on transforming consciousness and creating global unity and in integrative health and medicine. And we have some just incredibly inspiring speakers. It's going to be a really amazing event. And um, we do have limited in-person seats. So we're encouraging people who are interested in attending in person to um, register early. And we hope to see you um, either online or in person in October. And then lastly, just again, um, for those of you who are interested in um, studying more deeply around integrative health and medicine, we encourage you to look at our fellowship. We have a new cohort starting um, up here in the beginning of October. Um, it is a thousand hours evidence-based curriculum. Um, it is available for licensed providers with a master's degree um, or higher. And um, we will give you a $1,500 off your tuition for mentioning this ad and the wellness webinar today. So if you're interested in the fellowship, please come to AIHM.org slash fellowship. And um, stay connected with us in our community. Um, join, become a member. Um, we have a wonderful community of healers and clinicians that are really trying to help change this planet like Deanna and others. And um, you can join a local chapter, chapter and stay connected with us on social media. All of the recordings that we do for the wellness webinars are free and you can come back and watch them on YouTube um, or Facebook. So stay connected with us and thank you all. And Deanna, again, thank you so much for this a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I am ready for my weekend. <laughs> really great way to sit here. <laughs> Have a great, great weekend, everyone. We'll see you next week.